How many buttons does your old landline have? Twelve? That's so pedestrian. If you're a phone geek, you might know about the old military Autobahn phone system. These phones added four additional digits that could be used to indicate the urgency of a call. P for priority, I for immediate, or F for flash. If all the lines were tied up and you were an important enough person with an important enough call, there was also FO, flash override. Ooh, that sounds cool. Other calls be damned. We need to tell SAC to recall those bombers stat. We call touch tone dialing touch tone because you touch them and it makes a tone. Each button produces a tone. Technically, each button produces not one, but two different tones. Touch tone dialing is part of something we call DTMF, dual tone multi-frequency signaling. This makes it easier for equipment to detect key presses. Background noise or even the sound of someone's voice might trick a tone detector into thinking it has one of the tones, but it's far less common to falsely detect the presence of both tones at the same time. Touch tones have been around for a long time, long before smartphones, and so it's probably not a big surprise to learn that the circuitry used to make these tones was fairly basic. Each column on the keypad produced one of two tones, and each row produced the other. For example, the numbers 1, 2, and 3 all share the frequency 697 hertz in common, and the numbers 2, 5, 8, and 0 all share 1336 hertz in common. But only the number 2 is made up of both 697 hertz and 1336 hertz. Autovan used an additional column of 1,633 hertz to add the additional buttons. This fourth column isn't exclusive to Autovan. When these fourth column buttons are used outside of Autovan, we usually refer to them as A, B, C, and D. It's not common, but it can be found in various telecommunications applications. For instance, AMIS, the Audio Messaging Interchange Specification, which is used to transmit voicemail messages between different systems, uses these additional fourth column tones. If all phones had these, just think how they could be used. Instead of pressing 7 or something to delete a voicemail, maybe we just press D for delete. We can make things semi-standard across systems without having to repurpose numbers. Maybe add an extra layer of obscurity to your voicemail password. No more 1234 for me, but maybe 123 ABC? I've written a lot of interactive voice response menus and asterisk gateway interface scripts over the years. These things listen for touch tone button presses and perform some kind of result. Maybe it's as simple as routing your call to the correct department, or maybe it's something more useful like processing a bill payment over the phone. How nice would it be to be able to press the D key and get my scripts to start reading debug messages to me over the phone? Naturally, you wouldn't want to spit out any secure or sensitive information here. After all, anyone could send the D tone, but Odds of them accidentally sending it are pretty small, so it could be a neat thing to use. You can sometimes find old Autovan phones on eBay, but they generally go for more than I'd consider spending. Are you sensing a project? You're right. Phone freaks have used various gizmos over the years to produce tones to explore or just rip off phone networks. Possibly in tribute to Steve Wozniak's little blue box that allowed him to explore the in-band signaling of the long-distance telephone trunks of yesteryear. These devices were commonly called boxes and the type of device was identified by a color. There's a whole rainbow of colored boxes out there. For example, if you were tricking a payphone into thinking you deposited a quarter, you were red boxing. Although your device probably wasn't actually red in color. One of these so-called boxes was the silver box, a device to generate those fourth column tones. One of the simplest versions of the silver box involved modifying an existing phone and adding a toggle switch to switch the last column, three, six, nine, and pound, from 1,477 Hz to 1,633 Hz. If you were lucky enough, you might even have a local oscillator generating the 1,633 Hz in your phone. If not, you'd have to create a circuit to generate it. I've got a couple phones here that I'm going to combine the best parts of to make my silver box. Over here is the AT&T Traditional 100. It's going to be the body of my phone, and I'll be using most of its original electronics. The idea for this project came while I was looking at a picture of this phone online. I thought, huh, this extra columns of buttons and switches looks evenly spaced with the other buttons. I wonder if I could replace the keypad without having to modify the phone. Over here is the ComDial 2579, or at least I think that's the model number. I'm going to be using some of its dialing guts for the project. I assume it must have good dialing guts. I mean, dial is right there in the name, ComDial. Okay, actually, I've spread you the dig through my junk pile, and, and I found this one to be a good donor for this project. To see why, let's take a closer look. 
Okay, this is the keypad from the phone. I've removed it here so we can interrogate it a little bit. I've got this uh, multimeter hooked up on continuity mode so that when the probes make a connection, it'll beep. By moving the probes down the connection points of the keypad, we should be able to find two points that are bridged together and cause the beep when I'm holding down the uh, one key. What I'm going to look for here is uh, the first row. I'm trying to identify which pin corresponds to the first row. So I need to, this is kind of awkward because it's in this, uh, can't lay it flat. I'm going to try and hold down one and st still allow you to see what I'm doing if I can find an angle that kind of works here. So I'm just going down every point, listening for a beep, and then I move on to the next point, do the same thing. Okay, good. Uh, finally we found these two connect. So now what I want to know is which one is the row and which one is the column. So if I leave my probe in the point that I found, I move over to the end of the row and I continue probing. That's just me bumping the same pin. Okay, so now I know since I didn't move this one and I found uh, buttons one and three that correspond to this position, uh, that this pin here must be the uh, row pin for row one. And that's all I need to know right now. Uh, knowing at least the uh, position of one row is going to be essential for us to be able to create a digit. And uh, with this row in mind, then we're going to try and find uh, columns one, two, three, and four. Okay, I've started taking apart the COM dial 2579. Let me move this out of the way for a second. I've also rigged up a test number that will read back the touch tone digits I'm attempting to dial. Let me demonstrate that quickly. Okay, so when I'm connected to the number, anything I dial, it should just read back. One, two, three, zero. Pound. Dar. So I've got the test set hooked up to the same line as the phone. You can listen to what's happening. As you can see, I've removed the keypad from the phone, uh, and this is the ribbon cable that was originally attached to the keypad. On it, I've got a jumper, and the other side of the jumper goes to this wire here, so I can probe around. This uh, pin is the one that we found a moment ago. It's the one that corresponds to row one on, on the keypad. So uh, just from the ribbon cable, we should be able to make the digits one, two, and three across the first row as we find columns one, two, th and three. So if we're lucky, the fourth column that didn't go to any keys could be exposed here. There's really no reason they would do that because there's no set of digits, but we might as well probe around and check real quick. Two. It's kind of loud. Okay, and the rest of the pins are columns. So we, we found all of our, or, or sorry, the rest of the pins are rows. We found all of our columns. Uh, and so if we actually look at where this ribbon cable goes under the circuit board, we can kind of see that everything converges along this 16 pin dip here. Um, and so if we look carefully, we see traces going to almost all of these pins, except for this one floating out here by itself. This unhooked up one here could be any number of things. It could be used in an application somewhere else. Uh, that application maybe uses the fourth column. Uh, if this if this DTMF encoder or this DTMF generator, um, if this DTMF generator has a fourth column, it could easily be this one that's not connected to, to anything here. So you wouldn't really want to go and probe this if it was connected to I mean, it's just not wise in general, but especially if it was connected to a regular telephone network, you could do all sorts of uh, damage to your phone, to the network, whatever. Um, <clears throat> this is connected to an analog telephone adapter that I own, um, and I'm comfortable with blowing the phone up or the analog telephone adapter or whatever. So I'm going to go ahead and probe this and see what we get. A. Yeah, so we heard the letter A, so we know actually that must be our fourth column. Cool. Um, and so now all we have to do is um, identify how to hook this up to my keypad. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to go ahead and we'll take a closer look at that integrated circuit underneath. 
Okay, I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this here, but this is the chip that's uh, going to our keypad here. We can actually f flip it back and forth and follow the traces from here to the chip. Uh, if I look at it, it, it's labeled AMI, which is actually American Microsystems Incorporated. The chip here is the S2559F, um, and if I pull up the data sheet for that, we can see that uh, from the data sheet, uh, the pin configuration here, our columns are pins 3, 4, 5, and 9. And as you can see, way down here on the end is our pin 9. Uh, here's uh, the notch that indicates pin 1 is over here, count down 8, and start coming up this side, this is pin 9. Uh, that's the uh, one that corresponds to column 4, and that's the one that we were using uh, with row 1 to generate the letter A. All we need to do is take this chip, uh, actually, and if we're looking at the data sheet again, we can also see that pins 7 and 8 connect to a crystal oscillator. That's this guy right here, and he's going to be necessary for us to work with this chip and generate the tones. So I'm going to desolder this chip and the crystal from this poor phone, but don't worry too much. I think I'm also going to cannibalize this mechanical bell ringer for a different project. Uh, Comdial isn't exactly a highly collected phone brand, so I don't feel too bad about parting this one out. Okay, so just as in the case with the first keypad, I've used the multimeter in continuity test mode to go through and uh, probe all of the uh, different positions on the keypad and figure out which pins of the uh, connections down here correspond to which columns and which rows, and then I've uh, written that all down. I've moved the DTMF generator and the oscillator onto a separate perf board here. Uh, and that's soldered down to the keypad, so hopefully I've got all of my keys hooked up to that. I put a, a dip socket where the IC used to be, and I've just got a couple wires pushed into it. So I'm getting the positive voltage at the ground, and the signal out is the yellow wire going back into it. So when I hook this up, uh, hopefully, if that's all the pins I actually need, I'll be able to use this keypad with the old phone circuit board. All right, so we're hooked up to the test set. We're called into my uh, test number, and we're going to just check out the keypad to make sure everything is working correctly. One, two, three, A, four, five, six, B, seven, eight, nine, C, star, zero, pound, D. All right, so everything seems to be working all right. Okay, so now all that's remaining is to try to move the generator chip into the AT&T traditional 100 phone. It's also possible that some of the remaining circuitry here that takes the tone out signal might be amplifying it. Um, we might need to move some of that over if we're not able to find an appropriate place on the other phone to inject our tones. Okay, so now we need to tear this thing apart and start probing around. I've got some of the screws off already. And it uh, looks like I need to take a couple others out, so we'll do that. Okay, the first thing we need to do is start looking for some place to tap our power from. So there's two types of voltage we have to deal with on a phone line. Uh, usually we have DC when the phone is off the hook, but when a call is coming in and it's ringing, there's actually an AC signal. Uh, these four diodes here will actually rectify the AC. Uh, that kind of gets filtered down to this ringing detection IC and that drives this little piezoelectric speaker. So we need to get something after these diodes. Uh, this chip right here is the brains of the operation. Now it's, it's unfortunately an AT&T specific chip. I can't really find a good data sheet for it, so I don't know what it does. It's obviously somewhere there's some memory built into it for the redial function. This ringer probably actually drives this guy. Um, the mute, the uh, pulse or tone dialing, so this thing can probably generate the rotary dialing too. Ideally, if this had the fourth column on it, we wouldn't need another chip, but uh, I've kind of probed around with it already. I couldn't find a fourth column, and uh, it kind of makes sense. If, if it's a fairly specific chip for this phone, there's no fourth column. There'd be no, uh, there'd be no need for that, so why would it be in here in the first place? Once I find DC that's uh, going to be you know, rectified so we, do, we don't accidentally end up with some AC in our signal. One of the points we can look at taking, or one of the clues that we can get as to, in terms of uh, the voltage potentials we might see, is by looking at the ratings of the capacitors. So this guy here, he's rated at uh, something big. This is 250 volts, which of course it's, it's not gonna see, but these things are generally going to have ratings higher uh, 
well, of course, right? These things are gonna have higher ratings than what they expect to see, but if we find something uh, lower, something rated for, say, 10 volts, uh, we know our IC can handle 10 volts, that capacitor should never see 10 volts if it was chosen correctly, right? So we can kind of look around at some of these, and what we'll want to do is, with the system off the hook and using a voltmeter, determine if the voltage is somewhat stable. If we're measuring it and we kind of see that the voltage is constantly dropping down, then we kind of know that the capacitor is slowly draining and it's not going to be a stable voltage source for us probably. So uh, one of these pins at least is uh, the voltage supply for this. Um, so I'm going to start probing around there, uh, find a ground point, and uh, see what we can what we can uncover. Okay, so not to get too far ahead of myself, what I've done here is remove the keypad and I've uh, taken the main IC here that seems to be some kind of uh, special purpose AT&T integrated circuit for telephones. Okay, so I've removed the keypad and uh, using the continuity test that we did earlier, uh, I found that the six key uh, maps to these two wires, so I've soldered just a couple wires onto it to be able to bridge connection so I don't need the keypad anymore. Uh, I've removed this IC and I've socketed it and I just have it kind of loosely sitting in there so I can easily remove it. So this IC probably isn't really any good to me, I don't think that fourth column is on there. There's no data sheet for it, some AT&T special things. So just by probing around, I'm going to look for the voltage supply and uh, uh, ground and uh, any other points of interest to me. Uh, but just to make sure everything is still working here, uh, I've got my test number dialed and I'm on speakerphone and... Six. So this I see still working, the thing's all together, these pins make the number six, so everything's good. So my next step here is to do a couple of small steps. Um, I want to power this keypad from the comm dial because I know that works. I want to take the output tone line uh, from that, that's the yellow one here. I want to find where the tone comes off of from here, inject it in there, and maybe make a common ground wire between the two of them or something. But. I want to make sure that the tone injection in here works and I don't want an extra variable of wondering if the power provided from this is enough to sufficiently run this DTMF generator from the comm dial. So I'm going to remove some variables basically and I'll focus on just trying to find a place to inject the tone over here. Okay so I've lifted a bunch of the pins here, just bent them up so that they're not making a connection. And I'm just trying to find things that are not essential, but we'll still Six. let me uh, do that. <clears throat> so I think I've got maybe an idea on uh, which pin might be a good candidate for my tone out. And kind of following the circuits on the uh, the, the traces on the back, uh, it looks like it's also tying into um, some stuff that will lead into the microphone here. So I feel sort of good about that. So I'm going to switch over to the other phone and see about injecting my tone back into this one. So I wrongfully assumed that um, I was overdriving something or, or that I needed some resistance added, so I played around with that. Uh, I finally uh, I broke some of these uh, pins off, lifting and setting and lifting and setting. Of course that was going to happen. Uh, I finally found that this uh, pin on the end, which I guess would be uh, number 10 on the AT&T IC, is the tone out from this. Uh, maybe. Uh, well, <laughs> let, let me uh, explain. So pin 10 and uh, pin 17 uh, both need to be uh, socketed for this chip to generate any audio. Well, to, yeah, to generate any audio. I don't, I don't get any audio with out both of those. And I thought, well, <clears throat> maybe one is muting something when I hit a thing so you don't blast in the, you know, uh, in, in your ear. You can hear when I um, generate a touch tone on here that uh, it's quite loud Eight. on my test set, and that might be pretty loud in the handset. So I thought, okay, you know, that's not uncommon for a thing to, to mute something or, or whatever. <sighs> I... I don't honestly know, but I had it narrowed down between uh, that that pin um, 9, uh, sorry, wait, uh, pin 10 and uh, pin 17. Uh, ultimately, what I ended up needing to do is to bridge pin 10 and 17 together and then inject my signal. Uh, well, at this point, I guess I'd either, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure the... Um, 
well, here's what I did actually. I lifted this pin, uh, took that and inserted that signal output from this into the comm dial and that sounded fine. So I'm pretty sure 10 is the tone out and I don't fully understand how uh, pin 15 was really involved in in the process here. Um, but again, if I uh, bridge those two like this, then my Eight, generator finally one, seems to work correctly. Four, five, which six, B, C, nine, eight, seven, star, zero. So that's good enough for me. Um, so. <laughs> I want to wrap this up, so I'm going to, I guess, I'll just bridge those and uh, install the new keypad and box everything up. Okay, just uh, fired this up and uh, it's all soldered together. I wanted to give it one more, one more test before I put it into the case. Uh, so I've got the tone generator from the comm dial, uh, keypad wired up, and the AT&T Traditional 100 circuit board. I think I made a mistake and I referred to uh, pin uh, 15 a couple times when I meant to say pin 17. The AT&T IC that we removed is 18 pin and I just kept thinking of it in terms of a 16 pin just because I'm just more used to running into that I guess. Uh, the wiring finally got um, settled on uh, pin 1 supplying the voltage. Pin 6 is the ground. Pin 10 is where I'm injecting this the output signal from the generator. And then I bridged pin 10 on the IC uh, socket here to uh, pin 17. I've removed the socket too, and so we're just wires straight through. Four. So I don't have to worry about that coming loose once I put it into the enclosure. And uh, nothing left to do but box her up. To get everything to fit well, I had to uh, cut a couple pieces of plastic off, but the face still holds securely on there. And I like uh, scraped a little notch on, I can't see. And I. Uh, cut a little bit of the top off here so that it can fit uh, with some clearance in there, um, but no big deal. Okay, so I've got it all back together and I'm uh, just going to do the inaugural test call with it. I've got my test set going, you can kind of hear it hissing in the background. Since I've got the handset connected now, I can't uh, pick it up without getting feedback from the speakerphone of the test set, um, so I'm going to try and kind of hold the microphone with my hand so that it doesn't make as much noise. There we go. Now I'm going to dial my test number. I'm connected to the test number, that's the beep, and I'm just going to test the keypad. One. 